This video is for educational purposes only. Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome to the channel, everybody. Here we go. Did you know that there's a disturbing backstory to this children's book? This is Eric and Corey Richens, and they live together with their three young children in Utah. Eric had a renovation business, and Corey was a real estate agent. On March 4th of 2022, around 3.22 a.m., Corey called 911 after walking into her room, and according to her, she saw Eric lying on the ground, and he just looked cold to the touch. Once officers and paramedics arrived at the scene, they did pronounce him dead. Corey stated that that night, she made a vodka drink for her husband to celebrate that she had sold the house. She then stated she went to go lay down with one of her children in their room because they were having nightmares and she returned to her and her husband's room around 3 a.m. and that's when she found Eric on the floor. An autopsy was done on Eric and it revealed that he died after ingesting five times the lethal dose of fentanyl. Not long after Eric's death, Corey had published a children's book called Are You With Me? and this was catered towards children who were grieving after losing one of their parents. Investigators ended up looking through Corey's phone and that's when they saw text messages between her and another person buying drugs for them to poison Eric. This was not the first time that Corey tried to poison Eric, just the other times she just did not succeed. Supposedly, Eric wanted a divorce from Corey and just a few weeks before his death, he has changed his will and life insurance policy. Eric has told his family many times, if something happens to me, it's my wife's fault. Corey was arrested and is currently sitting in jail waiting on trial. A story that just continues to keep me up at night is what happened to the Yuba County Five. 1978, there were five men that were coming from a basketball game in Chico back down to Yuba City in the middle of the night. Now, all five of the men suffered from mild intellectual and psychological disability. You're never going to know why they did this, but for some reason, when they were on the highway, they got off of the highway and went onto a dirt back road in the Plumas National Forest. You know is that for whatever reason, they eventually got out of their car and started walking on foot and they vanished. Police eventually found that car and they expected something's wrong with this. Not the case, the car had gas and it was working fine, so why did they get out of it and walk through the woods? Nobody knew what happened to them until eventually somebody stumbled into this cabin. Quick before I get into it, if you want the full episode on this, you can listen to it on Creep Time, the podcast. Inside that cabin was the body of Ted Wire and he had lost 80 pounds. Didn't make any sense because the cabin was full of food. Eventually they found everyone's body except for Gary Mathias. This 74-year-old woman robbed a bank after she was scammed of her life savings. This all happened in Ohio when Ann Mayers walked inside a credit union with a face mask on and demanded that the bank teller give her money while she threatened them with a gun. She ended up only taking $500 and then she got in her car and drove off. It only took police two hours to find Ann in her home and when they arrived, she was gardening and pretended like she had no idea what was going on. She eventually admitted to the crime and it turns out that Anne was recently scammed out of thousands of dollars online and owed a lot of money to family and friends. And because of that, she became pretty desperate and felt like her only way out of this mess was to rob a bank and thought that she would get away with it. Her sister also told police that Anne was going around telling family members that she was going to do this, but everyone thought that she was only joking. She was charged with aggravated robbery with a firearm and tampering with evidence and is being held on a $100,000 bond. The UK's heaviest man, Jason Holton, has just passed away one week before his 34th birthday. His heartbroken mother said that he began overeating as a teenager after his father passed away. And at one point, he was eating roughly 10,000 calories a day. Over the years, his weight increased to the point where his legs could no longer hold him. And after becoming bedridden, he didn't leave his room for a staggering six months. He said he would cry every day because he felt like he had imprisoned himself. At that point, he weighed around 317 kg, or for those who need US 700 pounds. In 2020, his organs began to shut down and he had to be airlifted by crane from his mother's third floor flat by a team of more than 30 firemen and engineers. When he got to the hospital, doctors said that they wanted to send him to London Zoo to get a heart scan because the only machine big enough to hold him was used by vets for very large animals. Luckily, thanks to his treatment at hospital, his condition began to stabilize. But four years later, he was rushed to hospital yet again. But this time, doctors said that they couldn't save him and he had about a week left to live. The coroner's report stated on Tuesday he died from organ failure and obesity at only 33 years old. Way too young.
This woman got zero prison time after stabbing her boyfriend 108 times. In 2018, 26-year-old Chad O'Melia's life was savagely taken in his apartment in California by his girlfriend. 33-year-old Bryn Spetcher says that on this day, she was tricked by Chad into smoking a highly potent strain of marijuana, which caused her to go into psychosis. She says that she remembers immediately walking into the kitchen and grabbing several knives and stabbed her dog before going after Chad and taking his life. Bryn then turned a knife on herself and attempted to take her own life before police arrived. And authorities also said that it wasn't easy restraining Bryn and that the taser didn't even work on her. Now, Bryn's defense argues that she reacted this way because she only smoked less than six times in her life, which that combined with the high potent marijuana explains why she took her boyfriend's life. Bryn ended up only receiving just two years of probation, a hundred hours of community service and no prison time but what's the dog gotta do with it pastor is being accused of unaliving his own wife this case is currently ongoing, but it's been so highly suggested, so this is what we know so far. On April 28th, Pastor John Paul Miller made the shocking announcement at the end of his church service that his wife, Micah, had unalived herself. He then asked everyone to leave quietly and not discuss his wife's death. Micah's family and friends do not believe this cause of death and have taken to social media with the hashtag justice for Micah. John Paul also wrote Micah's obituary where he talked mostly about himself, not even Micah who's the one that passed away. He also painted their marriage as like a perfect relationship, which is really odd considering that Micah filed for divorce and a restraining order against her husband only days before her passing. In the weeks prior to Micah's passing, she was sharing on Facebook about abusive relationships and really just hinting that something wasn't right. A friend of Micah's has come out and confirmed that Micah told her that there was abuse in the marriage and also that church funds were being used for things not church related. And since more friends and family of Micah have come out with similar accounts. Also been some speculation that John Paul was having an affair, a years long affair with this woman that he's been seen in the days before and the days after Micah's death. That woman's husband also passed away in a really suspicious way, but that's just online speculation for right now. The investigation is currently ongoing, so hopefully we have answers really, really soon. But in the meantime, make sure to leave all your thoughts, theories, questions, and case suggestions in the comments for me. The FBI caught a serial killer whose goal was to become a beast or an animal, specifically a bear slash saber tooth tiger hybrid. He had built himself a beast suit that he was using to maul his victims. When the FBI was originally looking at the bodies of the deceased, they thought it was a regular animal mauling. However, they soon realized it was fossilized skulls that were making these impressions. This led them to investigate Randall Tier, a man who was working at an anthropology department at a museum. He engineered the suit himself at his house, and he used parts of bones that he was stealing from his museum job. However, Randall Tier is also a victim in this situation, because when he was younger, he was seeing a psychiatrist for these urges that he was having to become a beast, but his psychiatrist was none other than Hannibal Lecter. Hannibal Lecter is far from an ethical psychiatrist and actually used psychic driving to make Randall Tear become the beast that he is today. He actively encouraged Randall's urges to become a beast and even gave him ideas on how to do this and how to be sneaky about it. And that's another reason why Hannibal Lecter is so evil and I make this point all the time. Because Hannibal Lecter is not just a serial killer, he's not just eating people, he is actively incubating other serial killers as his career goes on as a psychiatrist. How far would you go to get more guac at Chipotle? Because this man shot an employee at Chipotle over his serving size. On April 5th, 32 year old Aaron Brown walked into a Chipotle in Southfield, Michigan to order some food and then insulted an employee when he wasn't served enough guac. Aaron was then seen on surveillance video going around the counter and packing his order with more guac until a worker knocked the guac out of his hand. That's when Aaron grabbed the 21 year old worker and slammed him into the fridge and shot him in the knee. And while all the customers were terrified and ran out the restaurant, Aaron was seen calmly collecting his food and drove off without speeding. But Aaron didn't even make it too far since this Chipotle was located across the street from the police station and he was arrested. He was charged and was being held in the Oakland County Jail on a $20,000 bond. And all for some guac.
That must be a very good guac then. Do you think that you would be able to predict if someone in your life is or could become a serial killer? Is there a trait that they all have in common? Is there a recipe that creates a serial killer? Are they born evil? Is it a product of their environment? Some experts believe that there is a recipe. The McDonald's triad which are three elements that are the key to predict if someone will grow up to become a serial killer. Being cruel to animals, setting things on fire, and wetting the bed after the age of five. Many experts also say that a serial killer's childhood holds the key and believe that nearly 100% of serial killers experience some kind of mistreatment in their childhood. I find really interesting because some of the most infamous serial killers Ted Bundy, Jeffrey Dahmer, Paul Bernardo all claim to have come from really loving childhoods. Turns out that head trauma in adolescence could also be a big factor. Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker, David Berkowitz, son of Sam, and Fred West, and many others all experienced some kind of extreme head trauma in their adolescence that resulted in a change of behavior. So it's pretty well known that a majority of serial killers are white men between the ages of 25 and 34, but did you know a majority of serial killers are from the United States? by like a ridiculous majority. These statistics are so scary. For my astrology girlies, most serial killers are either Virgos or Geminis. New York is the state with the most serial killers and most serial killers are born in November than any other month. Statistically, you are more likely to become a serial killer if you're the eldest child and the least likely if you are an only child. Also more likely to become a serial killer if you are left-handed. What do you think makes a serial killer? Do you think it's genetics or bad childhood or just because they are left-handed? And is there anyone in your life that maybe you're looking at a little bit differently now? Let me know in the comments. So if you didn't know, this woman's name is Brianna Williams. And what you just watched was her reaction to finding out that the police had discovered her sinister secret. So back in early November of 2019, Brianna contacts the police in order to report her five-year-old daughter, Taylor Williams, missing, stating that she had seen her the night before, but in the morning, she was gone. Taylor's disappearance sent shockwaves through the community, and people quickly began looking for her, but she was nowhere to be found. However, weeks into the investigation, doubts begin to surface as detectives realize Brianna's story just doesn't make sense. Then. All of a sudden, Taylor's remains are found 400 miles away from her house, with investigators ruling that her cause of death was starvation, meaning Brianna had unalived her. At this point, Brianna knows that the police had figured out what she had done, so she tries to unalive herself, but this fails and she gets arrested. In court, Brianna is found guilty of Taylor's death and is sentenced to a well-deserved life in prison. Brianna's story shows that you cannot escape justice and that karma will always catch up to you. Poor child, at least she wouldn't suffer anymore. Missing American and Australian surfers were just found dead in a well in Mexico. Behind me is Callum and Jake Robinson and Jack Rhodes. They were missing for about a week and then they were found dead in a well in Ensenada, Mexico. They all disappeared on April 28th. They were last seen in Baja, California surfing. One of the family members got worried because one of the men were a type one diabetic and he hadn't communicated for a while, which was out of character for him. Then on Saturday, May 4th, all of the men were found inside of a well and a fourth man was also found, but he was unrelated to these three. Apparently the fourth random man's body had been there for a long time. So I'm assuming this is kind of a reoccurring thing that was happening. They were killing people and stuffing them in the well here. Police believe these men were killed by thieves trying to steal things from their trucks, such as tires, catalytic converters, stuff like that. All three men were fatally shot and dumped inside of the well. And three men in connection with his death have been arrested. Names have not been released yet. And apparently this well was boarded up, making it nearly impossible to find. Let me know what you guys think about the story in the comment section below. And as always, these videos are for informational purposes only.
are you enjoying the show so far just let me know if you do i'm trying out a new series where i don't talk as much as the other videos that i made let me know if you like this one too please do me a favor and hit the like and subscribe button if you haven't already this definitely helps the channel grow viewer discretion is advised in april 2015 Shayna Sims arrived at a funeral home posing as a makeup artist. A 38-year-old woman called Tabitha had recently passed from natural causes and Shayna was there to work on the body. While she was there, instead of making the body look presentable for her funeral, Shayna carved off one of Tabitha's breasts and cut off one of her toes. She tore clumps of Tabitha's hair out, smeared her makeup, and then slashed her face. She even stole the shoes off Tabitha's feet before leaving. The attack was discovered by two horrified members of the funeral home who raced to tell the manager about what they had found. The police later arrested Shayna, and she was found with a folding knife with strands of Tabitha's hair still attached to it, as well as a pair of scissors, a box cutter and various makeup items. During the trial, it was revealed that Shayna had snapped after learning that her husband was apparently having an affair with Tabitha. Seething with anger, she took brutal revenge on her love rival and was found guilty of eating a body, interrupting a funeral, and unlawful removal of a body part from a deceased person. Shayna Sims was sentenced to 16 years in prison, but was released after only serving four. Update, Jade's ruining the vacations with her TikToks. That was the last TikTok ever posted by TikToker Anthony Barajas, aka Anthony Michael. On July 26, 2021, Anthony and his friend Riley were seeing a movie. On that evening, they were seeing the ironically violent film The Forever Purge, which itself is a critique on American violence. On that day, the two of them were just sitting inside of the theater enjoying the film when suddenly they were both shot in the back of the head. Now, sadly, Riley Goodrich, who was 18 at the time, would die at the scene, but Anthony, who was 19 at the time, was taken to a hospital but passed away a few days later. But why did this happen? Well, it's not a very clear story. So this is Joseph Jimenez, and he was actually arrested the day after the murder. He was the guy who pulled the trigger. Now, Joseph's friends were actually in the movie theater. There were only six people in the theater at the time. And they said that during the movie, Joseph was acting strange. He was mumbling to himself. And at one point, he left the theater and came back in with some sort of a package. Joseph's friends then left the theater because they were afraid of what he might do, and a few moments later, they saw Joseph running out of the side door, getting into his vehicle, and speeding away. So it turns out that Joseph had just randomly decided to murder Riley and Anthony. There was no motivation. He didn't know these two. He just decided he had to kill somebody. And strangely, their bodies weren't discovered until after the movie was over, because there was only six people in the theater, including Joseph, his three friends, and these two. So according to Joseph, he was hearing voices that were saying his friends and family were going to be killed if he didn't take a life. He also stated that he wished he didn't do it, but unfortunately, you can't take back an action like that. It's just chilling that even just sitting in a movie theater, an act of violence like this can strike you. And obviously, rest in peace to Riley and Anthony. This is such a tragic story. The reason that I thought Von was a serial killer, because I've come across people that have killed a lot of people in gang wars before. You know, I did the video about No Limit, G Herbo's crew. There's a guy called Mad Max that, you know, they say he had nine or ten bodies, right? But I think, for me, where I felt he became a serial killer was you got these multiple murders. There's more than three murders, they're more than a month apart, some of them are years apart. It was really like, when he became famous, the personal gratification that he seemed to get out of killing, I would say he was responsible for the murder of FBG Duck. Uh, in a way that he felt responsible. He tweeted a goat emoji like minutes after Duck was killed. You know, he got a lot of personal gratification out of these killings. I think he wanted to continue these killings and he wanted the whole world to know. I wish I'd have thought of this when I made the documentary. I've only thought of it after, but I feel like Von, I feel like he's the closest I could describe him to a traditional serial killer is the Zodiac Killer. Because Von killed all these people, he became famous, he wanted everyone to know that he killed all these people. But, you know, you ain't a killer if you only got two bodies. Like, Talk about bodies, I've got a few, four plus three, three plus two. Like, Von wanted the whole world to know that he was killing. He was putting out these codes. He was getting this personal gratification from killing, and he still wanted to kill. He wanted to have Duck killed. He wanted to have Man Man killed. There was a supposed rumored body in Atlanta. Now, I kind of disproved that in the video, but it's like, he wanted people to know he was a killer. I think he was more interested in getting people killed than rapping.
here's what baby reindeer didn't tell you. Unless you've been living under a rock for the past few weeks, you will probably have heard of Baby Reindeer. It's a new series on Netflix, which is a harrowing account of abuse and stalking. Now, it's told by the actual victim in this case, who plays himself. However, there are a few things that have been missed out. Now, Richard Gadd, as I said, was the victim in this case and told the story by playing himself. But Richard was actually a lot more successful than he gave himself credit for in the drama. He featured as an actor on Outlander and Click, and he also more recently co-wrote an episode of Sex Education. Obviously, we know Martha's real name and identity were left out of the series. Richard also intentionally changed elements of her character. He said that he wanted to change bits of her life, as well as obviously using a different name for her in the series, so that she wouldn't be hounded in real life. He actually wanted to prevent people from harassing the real stalker. Another element that was left out of the story were exactly how many messages his stalker left for him. Now, Richard has since stated that there were over 41,000 emails, 744 tweets, and 46 Facebook messages from four different Facebook accounts. He stated that the total length of all of the voicemails that the real Martha left for him totaled over 350 hours. She also sent him 106 pages of actual physical letters, which we never saw in the series. Richard stated that not only did his stalker send him emails, Facebook messages and tweets, she actually also sent him physical gifts. These gifts included an actual baby reindeer toy as a present, and she also sent him sleeping tablets and boxes. Another true crime story of how they were caught. Lee Hartley, a lieutenant in the Navy, was on a carrier warship when he started feeling ill, started having stomach cramps and vomiting. He would get better, but then get sick again. And it got so bad, he had to get flown out to Florida, where he later died in the hospital. A savvy doctor noticed that all his organs had been so damaged that he suspected there might be heavy metal poisoning, and he requested that at an autopsy. Because of that doctor, they tested for possible poisons, and they found that there was arsenic in his system. Now police had to look at 4,000 possible possible suspects aboard the ship. Police scoured all over the ship but couldn't find the source of the arsenic. Police were also able to learn that while he was in Spain, three months before his death, he was also feeling ill along with another shipmate. Police also found out when the ship stopped in Spain, his wife had actually flown out to meet with him for eight days. She had cooked both men breakfast before they fell ill. Police interviewed his wife Pamela and she denied involvement and would pass a polygraph test and the case would go cold for 13 years. Then in 1995, police reopened the investigation and started interviewing people close to the family. Police interviewed Pam's brother who actually said she had recruited him to try to kill her husband, but he refused. Arsenic is retained in the fingernails and hair of victims longer, so forensics were able to look at a strand of his hair to get a timeline of when he ingested the arsenic and how long he'd been exposed to it. Police determined that his wife Pamela sent him care packages when he was on deployment and through those hair samples, learned that he first got ill just a few weeks when he was on his deployment. He was then sick in Spain when his wife was there. Police believe the victim consumed baked goods from his wife while he was on ship and he continued to fall ill before he was hospitalized. Police also noted that Pam visited him in the hospital in Florida and the arsenic samples spiked yet again while she was there with him. Police interrogated Pamela and confronted her with the evidence and information and she quickly confessed. She told police she loved her husband so much she didn't want to break his heart by getting a divorce. What's crazy is she was charged with second degree murder, would get a 40 year sentence, but would be released after 16 years. But that was how she was caught. A high school football star who took his own life after falling victim to a sex fortune scam is finally seeing justice. Nigerian brothers Samuel and Samson Ogoshi posed as a woman on Instagram and tricked 17 year old Jordan DeMay into sending them intimate photos. They demanded the teen send threatening to share the pictures with his friends and family if he didn't pay up. Six hours later, DeMay was found dead. His last message was, I'm killing myself right now because of you. Now the scammers have pleaded guilty to conspiring to exploit teenage boys. When I tell you this brought tears to my eyes as a mom, this brought tears to my eyes, okay? This is Matthew and Savannah Baby, Baby Fabian. If most of y'all know the Savannah Soto case, um, 18 year old pregnant girl from Texas um, unfortunately she was found deceased her and her boyfriend were found deceased and she was pregnant with baby Fabian she was gonna be having him any day y'all this is baby Fabian this picture was shared 
by the family um and they wanted to show how peaceful he looked and he looked and the message says we will forever be grateful to at now i lay me down to sleep for these wonderful photos of our grandson fabian guerrera memories we can hold in our heart till we get to hold you again you are now an angel with mommy and daddy in heaven till the day we see matthew savannah and baby fabian again you will all be forever in our hearts i know all three are looking down on us as a family in heaven and these are some photos from the funeral you guys um she was buried holding her baby um it's hard to hold back tears right now but rest in peace to savannah matthew and baby fabian this is one of the scariest ghost stories I've heard, so now everyone's got to hear it. Back in 2003, there was this group of deployed American Marines who got moved into abandoned military housing that was dubbed Ghost Town. It got the name because apparently the first group of Marines that lived there only made it a week before they couldn't live there anymore. They said they couldn't sleep the entire time they were there. Like all night, they would hear the sounds of children laughing, of like footsteps up the stairs when there was no one there. I talk about it this week on the podcast, but one night, the new group that had moved in had to go out and patrol the area. So they're walking through the neighborhood, like past a bunch of abandoned houses. And then all of a sudden, one of the Marines just starts screaming. He throws his weapon down and just takes off running, like through enemy territory with no weapon. So half of the Marines chase after him and then the other half turn around to see what he was screaming at. They said that behind them, there was this creature that looked like a shadow come to life. It was really tall and skinny, but they said it had these bright glowing red eyes but before they knew what to do, it just vanished. The craziest part is that multiple other people have reported seeing this exact creature like in the area. If you want to hear more of these stories, you've got to check out the podcast this week. This math teach had s with two schoolboys and one of them got her pregnant. The boy told police in an interview that Joyners had given her 10 of the 11 digits to her phone number and challenged him to guess the other which he had, and that had led to them messaging each other. Joins groomed the first student by taking him to the Trafford Center and bought him a Gucci belt. Later, she drove the boy back to her flat in Salford, where they had sex twice. Rumors spread among the boy's friends, the jury heard, and Joins was suspended by her school in October 2021 after being arrested by police. She was subsequently charged and was due to face trial, but then it emerged she had been in a long-term intimate relationship with second student. She said the relationship had begun when the boy was 15 and he went to her flat twice where they kissed, but it became intimate when he turned 16 whilst she was on bail and face charges over the first student. Phone messages between then became more flirtatious. One he sent read, get your t out, and she replied, not tonight and then she went on to send him a photo of her bum in just her knickers sacked in july 2022 denies four charges of inappropriate activity with a child and two charges of inappropriate activity with a child as a person in a position of trust the trial continues and is expected to last two weeks Interesting facts you never knew. The last one will shock you. If you stay up all night, your body burns an extra 161 calories. If you pinch the skin on your elbow as hard as you can, you won't feel any pain. One of your friends wants to be more than a friend to you. It's the third person you see when you click on share and then more. A woman can get pregnant while she's already pregnant and have children by two different people at the same time. If you Google the word askew, the page will tilt slightly clockwise. Go do it and then come back and let me know if it worked in the comments below. This is a syndrome where people believe they're turning into trees called Cotard Syndrome. Almost 20 million people share the same birthday. Comment your birthday and see who has the same one as you. My birthday is August 29th. Before the last fact, support me by clicking the follow button for more interesting facts every day. A British Marine had a leg tattoo of Liverpool's motto, You'll never walk alone. He got hurt in Afghanistan and had to get his leg amputated, which also cut off part of the tattoo. Now it says, you'll never walk. What was Megan Thee Stallion talking about when she referenced Megan's Law? 
If this law existed, seven-year-old Megan Conca wouldn't have been essayed and killed. Jesse Timendakas had served time for two previous convictions for essay against children, but still he was able to move across the street from seven-year-old Megan Conca and her family. Her parents had no idea that the man who seemed to be chilling in his yard every time Megan went out to the play or draw with sidewalk chalk was watching her and waiting for the time to strike. On July 29, 1994, he lured the child into his house under the pretense that she could play with his new puppy. He essayed her, but because he didn't want her to report it, he strangled her with a belt, and he dumped her body in the nearby park. And the next day, he confessed to police and led them to the dump site. Evidence included blood stains, hair samples, and a bite mark on Jesse's hand because Megan had tried to fight back. He was initially given the death penalty, but the state of New Jersey changed this to life in prison without parole. And because Megan's family had no idea that they were living across the street from someone who had committed violent crimes against children, they fought to have a federal law passed in Megan's name. Megan's law requires law enforcement to make info on offenders public. By being a registered offender, you're added to the offender registry that includes your name, crimes, and address, and you must alert the government if you move. Before Megan's law, only five states required people like this to register as required in the Jacob Wetterling Act, which I covered in a separate video. Together, the Wetterling Act and Megan's Law protect the public in two ways. One, the registry itself, and two, community notification for the public. Megan's Law would have given Megan's family the chance to protect her. And looking at the list of offenders in your area is something I recommend for everybody to do, and let me know if you want me to make a tutorial on how to do that. So when Megan the Stallion referenced Megan's Law in her newest diss track, she was referencing the fact that Nicki Minaj is married to a offender. If you like this video, give me a follow and stay safe out there. This kid hated the Spanish teacher so much, he offered his friends £10 to murder her. Will Cornick's parents separated, but both were described as supportive. He enrolled at Corpus Christi in Year 7. His former head of year said he was polite and always showed up. Prior to the murder, he only had four instances of misbehavior in four and a half years at the school and had no criminal record. His classmates described him as academically gifted and unlikely to cause trouble. Will's personality changed after he collapsed while on holiday in Cornwall and he was diagnosed with diabetes. Sadly, he self-harmed due to the condition. In 2013, he was disappointed to learn that he wouldn't be able to join the army due to his diabetes. At Christmas that year, he sent a Facebook message to his friend where he talked about brutally murdering Anne Maguire, who was his Spanish teacher. Will had been planning the murder four days beforehand. It was said that he held a deep-seated grudge against Anne Maguire. He had also sent Facebook messages to his friends, asking them if they could murder her for £10. On the 28th of April 2014, Will attended class as normal. After morning break, he went to the top floor for his Spanish lessons. Midway through the lessons, he got up and started randomly attacking Anne stabbing her seven times in the back and neck with a 21 centimeter knife, one cut straight through her jugular vein. He then chased her into the corridor where Susan Francis was, who was the head of Spanish. She started to scream for help. She managed to separate and shield Anne from Will. Susan managed to put Anne in the room by herself and held the door closed to keep Will away from her. She was also pregnant at the time. Will then returned to class and told a friend that it was a shame that he had not killed Anne there and there. Will had brought a bottle of whiskey to celebrate and he admitted that he was going to kill two more teachers. He was sentenced to life in prison for the minimum of 20 years. made it to criminal TikTok, and these chemicals, when combined, will create deadly results. Remember to tag a friend below so they don't accidentally combine these chemicals and use them on someone that they don't like. All right, the first one, I'm sure everyone knows this, but if you mix these two common household ingredients, bleach and ammonia, for example, while cleaning a toilet, you know what this does? Creates mustard gas. But if you didn't already know this, if you combine bleach 
with someone's dog's piss that shit might make chlorine gas obviously not a lot but if the dog pisses a lot or it's in an enclosed space this will fucking cause some serious shit next up if you accidentally mix hydrogen peroxide and then mix that with vinegar at the right concentrations that creates something called paracetic acid i don't even know what the fuck that is but it sounds dangerous remember not to accidentally throw that on someone you don't like and last but not least there's a reason why you never mix bleach with rubbing alcohol okay the reason is it creates chloroform the shit that knocks you out and fucking kills you after a while remember do not use any of these and stay safe have you ever heard of leonardo chinchuli or the soap maker of corrigio sorry if i butchered that at the turn of the 20th century leonardo had 17 pregnancies in total out of those 17 pregnancies she lost three children to miscarriage and 10 died very young leonardo was very protective of her four remaining children especially her oldest son who was her favorite giuseppe Again, I'm sorry if I butchered that. Giuseppe decided to enlist in the Italian army to help with World War II efforts. Leonardo was deeply suspicious, and when her son joined the army, she turned to those superstitions to keep him safe. Leonardo would go on to murder three women from 1939 to 1940. She would lure them in under the guise of work or matchmaking in a different country. She had the women write detailed letters to her families explaining their trips. She would then kill them with an ax and bake them into tea cakes that she would feed to her son and her friends and family. With her last victim, she even went as far as to turn her into soap. But her last victim had family that didn't believe the story of the quick trip to a different country. They would involve the police and one of her family members had seen her go into Leonardo's home. It didn't take long for Leonardo to confess to everything. Leonardo's trial would only last for three days and she was sentenced to 33 years in prison. She died of a brain hemorrhage in prison on October 15th of 1970. She was 79 years old. I personally don't think that that was enough time, but what do you think? This girl killed her mum and then texted a photo of her body to her dad. In 2013, Rachel Hudson and her family were supposed to be celebrating Thanksgiving at their home in Virginia. However, the holiday would take a horrendously sinister turn. Rachel's mum was terminally ill 58-year-old Susan Lee. Rachel had been her mum's carer since she was just nine years old. On the evening in question, Rachel and her dad got into an argument. When her dad left the house the next day to make the most of the Black Friday sales, Rachel did something unthinkable. She took a weapon out of the wardrobe and loaded it. She apparently thought about unaliving herself at this point, but she didn't want to put her mum through the trauma of finding her body. She then walked into the room where her mum was and said, I'm sorry, this is what has to happen. Her mum apparently told her, you're crazy, and this is the point where Rachel killed her mum. When she texted her dad to break the news to him, he obviously didn't believe what she was saying. She then took a photo of her mum's body and texted it over to her dad. Rachel was sentenced initially to 50 years in prison, but this was reduced to 18 years because of an apparent undiagnosed mental illness. In an interview with People magazine, Gypsy Rose and her husband, Ryan Anderson, are sharing their love story. The couple got married in a prison ceremony in July 2022, but up until this point, we hadn't really known the details of how they met. But shortly before she was released, both Gypsy and Ryan spoke with People magazine and shared some more details of their love story. Ryan Anderson is a 37-year-old special education teacher originally from Gypsy's home state of Louisiana. He told People that they first met back in 2020 when he decided to take a chance and write to her. He said, it was when Tiger King was really popular. My coworker at the time said, I want to write to Tiger King. And I said, I'll tell you what, if you write to him, I'll write to Gypsy Rose Blanchard. In that first letter, Ryan told Gypsy, quote, what her story meant to me, and on the second page, I just let her have it. I told her everything about me. He didn't expect to hear back, but by May 2020, the two were corresponding regularly. Ryan said that he would get butterflies when he got an email from Gypsy, and when the two spoke on the phone for the first time and he heard her voice, that all but sealed the deal for him. Gypsy was also falling in love as Ryan, quote, became her emotional backbone. She said that they met when the pandemic was really strong and she had a lot of emotional ups and downs because of it. 
She said, Ryan has seen me through some really good times and some really hard times. I would say that he is probably the most compassionate soul that I've ever met and the most patient. She said, I could be a lot to handle. I could be an emotional handful, but he is so patient with her. Because of restrictions thanks to the pandemic, they didn't meet in person until July 2021. But they continued to get closer, and according to the interview with People, Ryan became so in tune with Gypsy's emotions that he could tell how she was feeling as soon as she picked up the phone. Gypsy said, we've been able to build this emotional bond that within two seconds of talking on the phone, he knows my emotions. She said, I'm thankful that I have a man that is open enough with his own emotions so I could let my emotions flow. On July 21st, 2022, Gypsy and Ryan got married in a prison ceremony. And today, December 28th, 2023, he was the one to pick her up when she was released. Gypsy also mentioned in the interview with People that she wants kids one day. She said, it's hard because I'm going into a new life and I'm newly married and I'm going to have kids one day and I'm going to have to explain to my kids why their grandmother on mommy's side isn't around. And that's going to be a really hard conversation. But by all accounts, it seems like Gypsy is really happy with Ryan and that he has been there supporting her through a lot. So hopefully he will be continuing to support her as she adjusts to her new life. <laughs> the couple that tortured and killed their au pair. Sophie Lynette was a 20-year-old French woman who wanted to work as an au pair in England so that she could learn English. A lot of people take on au pair positions for this reason. It's when you live with a family and take care of their kids while also learning their customs and language. She got a position working for Sabrina Quater and Lisa Madumi. They were French nationals that lived near London and everything seemed to be going great at first. Little did Sophie know, Sabrina had a very delusional and violent side of her. Sabrina ruled her household with an iron fist and hardly paid Sophie. Sim was very submissive to his wife, which is typically fine, but Sabrina began to abuse Sophie. Neighbors noticed that Sophie seemed stressed and sad and she had also lost a lot of weight. This is a photo taken just days before she died. Sabrina had withheld food and taken away Sophie's ID and cell phone so that she couldn't contact her family. Sabrina got it into her head that her au pair was in cahoots with her ex-boyfriend, Mark Walton. Sabrina was convinced that Sophie would get up in the middle of the night and let Mark into their house so that he could abuse their children. And her husband eventually started to believe her. And to be clear, Mark Walton didn't even live in England at the time and he had no idea who Sophie was. Over a period of several months, the couple beat Sophie, whipped her with extension cords, and then waterboarded her in their bathtub. On Sabrina's phone, they found that she actually recorded some of these interrogations, although the actual audio is not public. It wasn't until neighbors noticed black smoke and a foul odor coming from the couple's backyard. Firefighters showed up and they noticed that chicken was on the grill, but there was also a large fire next to the grill. Upon further inspection, they noticed a pair of glasses as well as human fingers and a nose. Sabrina and Sim had killed Sophie, but there was no way to tell for sure exactly how she died. The autopsy showed that she had been beaten severely and she had several cracked ribs and even a cracked sternum, which I guess means that they stepped on her chest. Because of her inflated lungs, they think that her cause of death was drowning. Both of them were sentenced to 30 years to life behind bars. No, because while this stuff has been going on in the world is reminding me of American Horror Story Apocalypse Season. Let's talk about it. Now, I talk a lot about this show because I feel like it is really woke and it is completely accurate with a lot of stuff that they talk about. So if you haven't watched the show or this episode, I'm about to give y'all a whole rundown of why I feel like it's reminding me of what's going on right now in the world. So this whole series was basically talking about the end times, the apocalypse, the end of the world, whatever you want to call it. And the world didn't end in a natural way. The world ended on the show because of the higher-ups and the Antichrist. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the dude that is like the, the spawn of Satan, so the son of Satan is the Antichrist, 
he, ever since he was a kid, he's just been super evil. Like, I'm talking about anybody that worked for them at their house, he would kill. As a little kid, he would kill all type of little animals. I'm talking about birds, all type of stuff. It was just really bad. He even had, like, the mark of the beast or something on his, on the back of his ear. It was crazy. So the lady that raised him was just so tired of burying all the nannies and maids and all this in the backyard. So she kicked him to the curb. So at this point, he's like a teenager, he's lost, he's the Antichrist, but he doesn't, he knows it, but he doesn't quite know, like, his powers yet. So he stumbles across this Church of Satan, where he meets one of the members that was actually really nice to him, and she finds out that he is the spawn of Satan. Now, everybody in this church, or whatever you want to call it, was waiting on this day. Like, that's all they've been waiting on was the Antichrist, of course, for obvious reasons. Their goal was to end the world and restart it over in the devil's image. So the lady that was basically helping the boy out, because at this point he was homeless, and he just stumbled across the church, and he met her there, she let him stay at her house. He was feeding him and everything like this. And he lost the only person that ever loved him, which was this lady that basically taught him everything he knew about, like, Satan and all that. So she was like, we can find her. We can get her back. We, we got powers. We got connections to everywhere, all over the world. And he was like, you can't do that because she's gone. And he was like, yes, we can. So she take him to this the, like multi-billion dollar tech company ran by these two boys that you would probably think like would be in their mom's basement playing the video games. And they were the cooperative. Y'all already know the other word for it, but I'm not going to say it on here because, you know, TikTok. They said how they sold their soul and that's how they got the most biggest tech company in the world. Mm -hmm. And those two boys that ran that tech company help the antichrist in the world so the only people that were saved were the people that was in the cooperative and the super rich people that could afford underground bunkers haven't a lot of these rich people been talking about how they have bunkers and all these underground shelters yeah all right but i said all that to say the world was ended by the higher ups and the only people that survived were the people that can afford it and people with a specific blood type I'm not going to say his name, but y'all already know who this story reminds me of. His initials is E.M. and he's super rich. But let me know what y'all think in the comments. This is one of the worst cases in human history. This is the murder of Christine Silouan. She was from the Philippines and was a volunteer in church and she used the church every day from 4 to 6 p.m. On the day of her murder, she went to church as per her schedule, but she didn't come home after that. Her parents then started to worry and they began searching for her with their neighbors. And what they found is absolutely horrid. They found her body in a farm where half her face was sliced like a piece of pizza and her face was literally skinned down to her skull. Also, her brain was completely destroyed by acid. The police then started investigating and they checked the cameras and found out that she was with a guy. The people started protesting about this case and the case was then given to special officers. They had a lot of pressure on this. A week before this happened, she broke up with her boyfriend so the police took him into custody and he was proving that he was at home all day when she was murdered but officers were completely tired of this case and they then sentenced him as the murderer. But after a few months, a thief was caught in a store where he confessed that he murdered and raped Christine. He said he started talking to her on Facebook with a fake account and was using fake photos of another guy that was pretty good looking. Christine fell for the guy and she assumed that he was about 20 years old and they started texting daily. One day they both decided to meet up at 6pm near the church she went to. But upon arriving, Christine noticed that this was not the guy she was talking to and he was around 40ish years old. She then refused to talk to him and tried to go back but he held her hands extremely forcefully. He then took her far away from town and raped her repeatedly and put iron rods inside her personal organs. He then cut her face in half and then skinned her whole head down to the skull. And to make it even worse, he put acid inside of her head. The autopsy also revealed that her tongue, trachea, esophagus, parts of her neck, and her right ear were missing. The self-proclaimed killer of this case named Renato Lanis said that he used barber type scissors and stabbed her 30 times on different parts of her body and skinned her face. Christine Silouan was only 16 years old and this case is extremely haunting. There's a picture of her body that was found in the field but Google did a really good job of not showing it and hiding it. 
so even if you do go looking for the picture, I don't think you're going to find it. This is one of those cases that after you get done reading it, you just feel some sort of uneasiness. I feel so bad for Christine's family, and I can't imagine finding my daughter in this state. May Christine Silouan rest in peace. This pedophile committed a crime so disturbing that a petition was created that asked the government to publicly hang him, and the petition gathered thousands of signatures. This is 33-year-old Benjamin Taylor from West Virginia, and in 2016, he would commit one of the most sickening crimes I've ever read about. Back in 2016, Benjamin was living with his girlfriend, a woman named Amanda Adkins. At the time, Amanda had recently given birth only nine months ago to her baby daughter, Emily. Emily was a beautiful young girl, and I want to warn you all right now, the details that we're about to discuss are some of the most disturbing I've ever covered. So in October of 2016, Benjamin had only been living with his girlfriend Amanda for about a month. And on the morning of Emily's death at around 4.30 a.m., Amanda woke up and went downstairs to search for her baby. When she went downstairs, she saw Benjamin Taylor with his pants unzipped sitting in the dark. Amanda then noticed that her nine-month-old daughter's limp body was lying nearby on a pile of sheets and laundry. Amanda screamed at Benjamin and grabbed her daughter's lifeless body, but he remained silent and stared at the ground. The details of what had just happened down there are disturbing. Local authorities would call this the worst assault that they had seen in decades. You see, Benjamin and Emily were covered in the infant's blood. After the child's body was examined, the authorities were able to determine that she had been assaulted by an adult male multiple times. The infant child was also bleeding extensively and had suffered head trauma. Emily had a fractured skull and brain hemorrhaging. Authorities believe that Emily may have been shaken violently, or even thrown to the ground or slammed against a hard object. When police arrived at the scene, Benjamin Taylor was observed trying to wipe something off of his groin. That was eventually determined to be Emily's blood. He also told authorities that he remembered taking the baby to the basement, but that he blacked out after that. You see, he had been smoking and drinking the night before, and that was his excuse. Thankfully, Benjamin was convicted of all charges and sentenced to life in prison without mercy, as you can see right here. But for some people, that just wasn't enough. And like I said at the beginning of this video, a petition was created which asked the government to publicly hang Benjamin. And this petition, before it was shut down, gathered over 50,000 signatures. I mean, this truly is one of the worst things that I've ever covered here on my TikTok. And personally, I don't think that life in prison is enough for this guy. I mean, the pain that poor Emily went through before she was eventually killed is just heartbreaking on every single level. And I just hope and pray that the other prisoners that are in there with Benjamin find out or already have found out exactly what he did to land himself in there. If you want to hear more true crime stories, listen to the podcast Murder in America that I co-host with my wife, Courtney. It's available on all streaming platforms. That's it for the video for today. Thank you everyone for showing up. I will end the video with the next clip. I hope to see you in the next video. Thank you once again and I'll see you around.